This episode of our This Week in XR podcast is sponsored by Zapper. Zapper is one of the world's leading XR companies. Over the past 12 years, they've won numerous awards for memorable campaigns. They've democratized AR by making tools and SDKs that anyone can use. And they created Zapbox, the world's most affordable mixed reality headset. Most recently, Zapper worked with Unilever to create an enhanced QR code called Accessible QR, which enables packaged goods to speak to the blind and partially sighted. If you're thinking XR, give the team at Zapper a call or visit zapper.com to see how they can help you on your XR journey. Good morning, everybody. I'm Charlie Fink with Brody Abovitz and Ted Chilowitz for This Week in XR. It is Friday, February 23rd, 2024. Good morning, guys. Good morning, gentlemen. Nice to see you. Here we are, another Good Friday morning. morning. It, we're two weeks out from South by Southwest, and uh, I want to remind you guys, although we were just talking about it in the green room, that we are going to be doing a panel at South by Southwest on the 12th of March at 11.30 a.m. in the Convention Center. It's a featured panel. We're going to be talking about the future of XR, the age of the Vision Pro. There's so much going on at South by Southwest. I won't. We've got a great show today. I don't want to go too far off track. But there's so much going on at South by Southwest this year. Every year, I start to do my schedule, and it's holy crow. These that going to South by Southwest, you have FOMO even if you're there, right? Yeah, because there's just so much to do. It's so big. And Rony, have you been ever in person to a South by Southwest? Will this be your first? The quick history for our listeners: my band played at South by Southwest a few shows. Right. The year that I started Magic Leap, like at least in my head, it was 2010. And we got invited back and a lot of Magic Leapers went to South by, but this will be my first year back and doing the keynote with you guys and also doing one the day before with Richard Taylor from Weta on Story World. So it'll be super fun and exciting. Very cool. Good. Yeah, we love us. It'll be a lot of fun. Great city. Keep it weird. We've all been talking about AI all week. Uh, Roni just sent me a note about the Wall Street feeding frenzy set off by the incredible earnings story that we've had this week from a number of companies, at, in particular NVIDIA, and it's just eaten the news cycle. And then while I was writing the column, I realized that we had just landed on the moon. Yeah. I thought, holy crow, probably <laughs> not eating the entire news cycle. It's like no. a ho-hum, right? It's NVIDIA is the uh, news. I have some personal connection points to that. And Roni, this is part of our, our uh, shared love of magic and lore. First of all, my friend, Sean Call who's been a space person. I've actually done space conferences with her and talked to her. That was where I got to meet Jeff Bezos and Buzz Aldrin in one gap together, which was stunning. And That's especially amazing. Especially last week, Buzz Aldrin punched a guy out, which was awesome. If you haven't seen <laughs> it on Twitter or, or TikTok, just search Buzz Aldrin punches a dude in the face. And Wait, how old was he when he did that? He, he was old when I met him, and this is seven years ago. So he's pretty oh old. God. He's an old guy. Uh, Buzz but, is a tough guy, but we love Buzz, him. Took the guy out and you, you must, for our listeners, you must see it if you haven't seen it. But the connection point on the, on the lunar landing, which of course made big international news is my friend was working with Jeff Koons to put a piece of artwork in the payload, which theoretically had now made it to the moon. It's a bunch of little moon pieces of art in a cube that was all hermetically sealed, put into the payload. And our mutual friend, David Copperfield, the magician has some of his secrets, which is it, it actually, he did this a while back with the. The Israeli lander that crashed, if you remember that, uh, well, a long time ago, but many years ago. And now he's got another small payload of some of his secrets on this special nickel disc on the moon. And he's also in the process of vanishing the moon, which is pretty big news. Like you can just Google that and you'll see David Copperfield vanishes the moon. So he's very connected to the humanity of the moon and he's doing something special. So Roni, that's... Can I ask a funny question? Does he vanish the moon at the same time as a planned eclipse or is it different? Yeah, I'm friends with him and I will not reveal anything okay. that David does that is special other than David is going to vanish the moon, uh, which awesome. is the moon is a fairly substantial piece of hardware to vanish compared to some of the other really substantial things he's vanished over the years. So keep an eye out for that. Just you guys, the listeners can Google it and you'll see there's an NBC news story. It's like big news. So he's a big celebrity. Yeah. Take a listen. So skipping over Wall Street directly to another AI story, uh, Sora. The new open AI <clears throat> text to video generative AI that can do up to 60 seconds of very realistic and convincing video. 
So it, this came out, we talked about it in the show last week. It came out, I, I think, the day of or the day before our show. And since then, it has eaten social media because I have very, follow a lot of media people as you do on socials, and they're all freaking out. Tyler Perry just halted construction uh, on the expansion of his studio in Atlanta because he's freaking out about Sorek. He doesn't know what it's going to mean for below the line film production. What the future of our industry looks like. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a bit so, like when IBM said, maybe we should stop making these typewriters. <laughs> yeah. That's sort of, yeah. yeah. Can I extrapolate? Sora represents what I think is happening in AI. I don't think it's going to be unique to Sora. I think people are now realizing like Midjourney and OpenAI and others were doing images and then they were doing little videos and Sora's just doing better videos. But if you just follow where things are going and why companies like NVIDIA are exploding, AI is going to eat up the entire economy in some way. And it's going to change all businesses in every sector. Maybe this was the wake-up call. Some people needed to be gently nudged. Others needed to be slapped in the face and others will get a punch in the gut. But if you're not on AI, if you don't understand what's happening, your business is in trouble. Guys, this is 1993. It's 1993. All, and the internet, all right? Over again. Yeah. All over again. And people are running around saying it's a fad. People are running around saying it's going to change everything. And But the internet and mobile after it, mobile computing after it, did change everything. Yeah. But well, we look, were being boiled like a frog, and it was happening. We were in the middle of it, so you can't feel the temperature going up. Can we, make really a bold, temperature. can we make a really bold thing for our listeners? Like crypto, weird fad, didn't have an underpinning. AI, absolutely not. AI is not a fad. XR, it's hard, but also not a fad. But AI is not only not a fad, its waves are crashing harder and harder, not every year, every month, yeah, yeah. every week. Like the rate of change is accelerating. So if you're not awake to it, you need to get on top of well, things. Let, let me give you an example in the news headlines. Lambda AI raises $320 million. I've never heard of this company. $320 million that are valued at over a billion dollars. And the guy putting in the money Thomas Toll is is the real deal. Yeah, and we're not a guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thomas Toll, I think a little bit Thomas Toll. <laughs> he was an investor. So th Thomas is a smart guy. Look, it sounds like a lot of money, 320 million, but the global economy today is over 105 trillion. I think investors are betting in tens of trillions of change. Yeah. So making hundreds of millions and billions of dollar bets are still like thousandths. Yeah. You know, one right. over a thousandth of tiny percent at the change bet. So I think you're going to see investments that start to go into the crazy numbers, like 10, $20 billion bets are still small against the giant change people anticipate. By the way, the winners and losers here will be profound. I think much more profound than the internet shift, like just incalculably Ooh. profound. You're more polarized, right? You're going to get more polarized. bigger winners and a lot more losers quicker. To your point about we're the, the boiling the frog thing it does not relate to this anymore. This is a very fast trajectory people are aware of. A lot of the stuff I've been tracking, which is interesting as they go to battle, is, uh, I don't know if you guys seen a lot of the kind of comparisons to what Runway can do versus Sora. There's a lot of that floating around. And they're both actually pretty good. And Runway is making extraordinarily stride, extraordinary strides as well because they're all effectively using the same concept and code base to actually find a way to generate images from text prompts. So Cristobal Valenzuela, the co-founder of Runway, you know what he had to say about Sora? No, tell me. I'm curious. Bring it on. Yeah, battle, right? They're battling. I would be more cautious if I was that fellow because you're <laughs> taking on a very big machine, which includes Microsoft. That yeah. uh, don't, don't Like from experience... Do your thing. Don't do head-on battles with the biggest lions. Just take but them on the side. But to the reverse point, one of the things that was amazing about the internet is it was a democrat democratization tool. People had the same resource tree. They may not have had the same capital or the same talent, but they had the same resource tree. And in my perspective, concept of what you're doing with a large language model or many subsets of large language model is a democratic factor. So small, medium, and large companies can effectively compete on seeing which one, like I'm, I'm using this term way more than I ever thought I would, which one will achieve escape velocity, going back to our moon reference, right? And our, our, is it's not necessarily about the quality of the work you can do or the technical underpinnings is, did you generate enough froth? Did you generate enough interest to 
achieve escape velocity and not get close and then fall crashing down to earth. And that to me is the mentality. It also brings up some of the stuff about Apple Vision Pro I'd love to talk to you about too. And Ted, you know what I think is going on here, Ted and Charlie? There's a lot of like new magic trick underneath the hood of technology, but I don't think those businesses are the ones that win. The ones that win have a more timeless approach. Like they're doing good design. They're going to understand customer needs really well. They're building good products. Yeah. Because the at, at some point, like anyone could generate an image. Anyone could stream a video, right? Well, I mean, what was the difference between like Zoom and Skype and others? It was like a good product, a good customer interface. Those things will come back into play. Right now we're in the G whiz oh my God, look what my AI can do. But the underlying thing of it, like powered by NVIDIA and a lot of the same math that everyone is sharing and cross-pollinating, everyone can do. That's the weird, like in the large language model world, they're all doing the same thing, which is- my point, ends. yes. It's going to be other things that actually make the difference in yeah, the And it's the picks and shovels thesis, right? It's the guys that build the underpinnings of all this are the ones, look, what is NVIDIA today? Two trillion, too large, as we say, based on the froth. And the perception that everyone will be using this as much as they use the old version of the internet. So it's a fascinating sort people of people are lining up to compete with uh, NVIDIA. So they've got several years and they're very smart and they'll diversify and they're not going to stop developing, obviously, advanced technology. But there's going to be so much investment in those, in that underpinning, in that hardware uh, that I think it. it Again, I don't think NVIDIA is going to make less money, but there's so much money to be made that so many others are going to come crashing in. We're talking about companies like Intel, which just made a deal to make custom chips with Microsoft. Can, can I make a prediction? Though? I think NVIDIA may be one of those companies that hit 10 trillion market cap. I, I don't think that's crazy wow. given the unlimited Intel. potential of AI's change on the economy. And they are the front runner to be the back end for a lot of that change, not all of it. But they are so far ahead of others trying to emulate their ability to power LLMs. I wouldn't be surprised if NVIDIA hits it. I'm calling it here. I have no stock in them. I just know Jensen, really crazy smart. That guy's on a roll. I think he might hit 10 trillion. That's wow. Now you're talking about a company that is, will be over three times at the height of Apple's valuation. Over yes. three times the most valuable company on planet Earth. Um, it's a shift. Think it's Who's going powering to be the future? Big. NVIDIA's actually had an eye on the future to power the future. And, and our friends at Google are moving to, a little bit too slow on that. Mm. And Apple is not necessarily driving that future at the front end right now. Right. They're behind well, on AI. They're not leading on AI. They're like behind everybody. On yeah, but right. remember, that is always Apple's strategy is never lead, always watch and find a way to execute, which is- Maybe that works here. Maybe it doesn't. That's not, it. We'll find when out. When you're right? taking yeah. on Jensen, I don't know. It's a different creature. That's yeah, pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. There's a bunch of other, <clears throat> excuse me, fundraising news and a couple of metaverse stories in the column. So uh, if you're interested in those, if you're interested in anything other than AI, take a quick look. Among my favorite stories, which again, I won't go into, into mostly for my self-preservation is that Forbes has announced uh, a huge deal with Sandbox VR to build a presence in the metaverse. Little story is completely out of context today, and I don't know what they're thinking. I have no insight, despite my seventh anniversary as a Forbes columnist. I still have no insight into what actually goes on at Forbes, but that's a pretty interesting development because nobody, that story used to be like one of a dozen stories two years ago. And now it's like, where that comes wandered in from 2022. It does feel like a little old school attempts to meet new school moment, right? It so is. It's, it's like, what? Sandbox? They're still around? Yeah. Pretty interesting. We've got a terrific guest, Catherine Conrad, a professor at the University of Kansas, and she has been writing about AI and education. I thought this would be a terrific topic for us, and she's a super nice and interesting person, as are all college professors. Absolutely. If I don't say so myself. It's like she's got her, her sunflower background up for us to chat with. She mentioned she may not be camera first today. Oh, there she, she is. Hi. Camera first? I'm camera first. <laughs> and you're wearing I've a been... headset. Thank you. I am because I didn't think anybody needed to hear my dogs barking. You might so. want to just pull the mic a little bit away from your mouth. You're a little over modulating. Right. Oh, perfect. That, is that all right? A little bit in. I'm just tweaking a little. Just Sure. Take is that go. better? Perfect. Yeah, perfect. 
I'm not a usual mic. I'm, nerd, I got so. mine on. I, Charlie and I have figured out the whole system. We, we... <laughs> you and I have been corresponding. We have not met. Welcome to the show, and thank you for agreeing to Thanks speak with me. us this morning. I've got with me my colleagues, Ted Shilowitz and uh, Roni Abovitz, who is the founder of Magic Leap, the great see-through, in fact, one of the few see true see-through XR technologies out there today. We mostly talk about XR, although lately we have focused on AI because it's eating the whole economy, and that's part of why we wanted to talk to you. Obviously, as an educator, I think a lot about AI and um, how to educate students in this new context or with this new tool. Yeah. How do we help them learn how to use it? They're going to become the natives, and uh, we're going to be looking from the outside in. But how, how can we help them make that world one that respects humanity and gives us the rocket sled that other innovations like the internet and the mobile phone have given us? Yeah, that's a great question. I came from I come from a, a background where I did a lot of experimenting in the 90s with tech and education, and there have been a lot of edutech solutions that have come and gone. And I, <laughs> my favorite is the, I don't know if you all remember Moos. They were not MOOCs. Those were the big classes, but Moos were mud object oriented spaces. They were based on D&D &D dungeons. Mm. We ex we're, <laughs> we're talking about those and exploring what you could do with those. Spoiler alert, not very much. Back in the 90s with my fellow graduate students. I'm, I've always been thinking, thinking about those kinds of questions. How can we use those technologies and how can we prepare our students to use them? And my, we can talk about this because I know this is going to be probably discipline specific, but I really, I've always been interested in how technologies frame how we know what we know. And, and I think that's important for students to have, to be conscious of, not necessarily be just, oh, here's a new toy, let's play with it although there, that's certainly part of the process, but also really trying to, to separate the hype and the kind of techno-determinism of a lot of the language and, so, and come back so to what are the affordances. Before we get into the meat of what we want to talk about with you today, we always want to give our listeners just a little background and, and a grounding of sure. who you are, where yeah, a little you come from, little bio. Yeah, a little sure. background so that you can dive in and they go, oh, now I understand why she wants to talk about this stuff. Sure. So you want me to give you a bio? Yeah, <laughs> we're just, just yeah. not just having a bio, but just a little bit of what you're passionate about, what you're doing with the school, yeah. where you're from, a little bit of background. Yeah, how long have you been doing it, so forth? Yeah, I've been, I've been teaching for about 30 years, but, and I'm at the University of Kansas. I'm an English professor, but I, my research areas have been in technology and culture, so I've been doing working on that, thinking about modernism and Irish literature, surveillance technologies in <laughs> contemporary Northern Ireland, Dracula and technology. I've got a, it's a long and it's seemingly disconnected, but they're all connected around that question of how technology mediates our experience. That's my research area. Teaching wise, I've been teaching with and about technologies for a long time. And I have a, a first year course that I teach called Ways of Knowing. And we read Sherry Turkle. We read John Lanier, we read Nick Bostrom, we, need, we hey, read a lot of those sorts of questions. And your students know how to read? <laughs> Amazing, right? It's a skill. And I think it's, a, it's an important skill that, that's challenged. We can talk about that if you I want. I never but... assign anything that can't be consumed on a smartphone. You can read on a smartphone. I you do can. a lot of reading. That's, in fact, we do more reading than we ever have. Yeah, yeah. we do a lot. Oh, it might be short form, and, and, but, but yeah, certainly. So, so in 30 years, in 30 years yeah. of being a professor mm -hmm. and seeing all that five or six generations of students pass through your world mm -hmm. and your insights. What are the biggest things you've seen, you've learned? What has changed in 30 years? Mm. Uh, so let's, we're talking the, the late pre-2000s today, right? So yeah. I think about my arc 30 years. I'm very curious what your arc 30 years. What, what insights can you give to all of our listeners that you've learned in 30 years watching students move through your class and, and head out into the world? Wow, that's a good question. I've seen some good shifts, and I would say I was chair of our department during the pandemic, and so it's really hard not to see everything through that lens. I'm very familiar with disruption. I was very interested in in large language models and other sort of AI or so-called AI tools as an as another sort of educational disruption moment that we could prod. And I don't know. 
in a lot of ways, students are very similar, but I do think that as they move more to screens, and this is totally anecdotal. I haven't done the research, but I do think- Anecdotal is actually been, the best stories for us. The more yeah, I do feel that there's been more, we all know there's more social, social isolation during the pandemic. A lot of students are thirsty for connection, but not able to make it and are struggling more with that for whatever reasons. And there may be many. And that that can have an effect on their work. But that said, like the engaged students, the passionate students, they're the ones that take what we do in higher ed in K-12 and higher ed and do something exciting with it. I do think that even what might seem like old skills are still skills that we see students using in new ways. So I was most excited during the pandemic. When we had, since we couldn't do our little in-person, what do you do with an English major panel, for instance? We just got a bunch of our alumni together on these amazing panels where we had, we had our neurosurgeon who was an English major and we had our entrepreneur, entrepreneurs who were English majors and people in all these different fields come back and say, this is what my major did for me. This is what my education did for me. It's, it, Within an educational sphere, we know how to do what we do, but it's exciting to see alumni come back and tell us what they can do with it. And those things have been have been exciting to see, but they've also been one thing. There was a recent study, I think, in, inside higher ed did about what students want in this AI moment. And a lot of them were those critical core competencies, critical thinking, and they wanted to know about ethical use of AI. Those are the kinds of things that that I think are the same, some of those core things. But I do think that their social environment and, of course, the real instability right now, it's hard. If you follow social media, it's hard not to see all the layoffs and anxiety. They're, they're in a very different economic space than we were when we came out. I'm assuming we're all more than 25 uh, in, this, in the Zoom room. So, hey, Katie, can I ask you what's like a slightly tough philosophical question, but you're a professor. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's fair game. I've been asked this a lot, but I'd love to get your take. How do you talk to your students and how do you guide them into thinking about their role, how to think, how to be a human being in this age where AI is surpassing us in everything. It really seems to be in all ways that the egotism of the human as the center of the world is probably ending. But so how do you, how do you guide them? What would you do when we were in college? It was coming. It was science fiction, but now it's here. We talked about it coming. Now, now we're here. What do you tell them? How do you get them to deal with this existential shift that no one's in history ever had to dealt with as a human being? I would argue that at these sort of disruptive and technological advanced moments, we are often either blind to their impact, right? Because we're in the middle of it. You can look back at Plato talking about the, the advent of written language and what that would do. We don't always know where it's going. We're right in the middle of it right now. That said, and I'm interim director of the Center for the Study of Science Fiction right now. So that's not my main specialty. But, but what I would say is it's easy. I'm going to push back a little bit on that idea because I do think I'm always interested in questions of what it means to be human and, and humility. I think we need to have humility in the face of each other as well as in the tools we create. But I'd push back on the idea that we're at that point. I think the fact that we're calling large language models and visual generators intelligences is perhaps part of the problem. And I think there have been plenty of people who work in cognitive science who are like, yeah, no, this isn't that. This is amazing. I don't mean to diminish what it can do. But I also like to wheel back people like Teg Ching, who've written science fiction about artif actual artificial intelligences and pushed at those questions are saying, yeah, that, this isn't that. This isn't what I'm writing about. This is a different thing. But we've lumped them all together under this big umbrella, and we've lumped them under the, that big umbrella in order to sell them, if I can be a little cynical. So that's, I would say, yes, I think it's really important to understand where we are. And that's why I think critical AI literacy, which is my approach, to go back to Charlie's initial question that I was taking along, I will talk your ear off if you want, but. That's that's why you're literacy seems to be to be Charlie, we, we need Katie for a whole hour on this because yeah. like this could be I'll leave you this one quick thing then we should go yeah, back sure. to Charlie Ted but we'll probably disagree on is it intelligence and what's the definition of intelligence but when Gary Kasparov lost to IBM it didn't matter how smart he was a human was just not going to be the chess AI ever again and as people lose in different categories that we are supposed to be better than anything else at 
if it's if we define it as intelligent, but it's simply doing the job better, faster, the philosophical question of is it intelligent won't matter. It's doing the job in all the categories that we're supposed to do the job in. And that's scary. Like writing books, doing art, making movies, designing things. And then the free market will start to choose things that do it at incredible speed and quality and cost. They won't philosophically care. Is it alive? Does it have a consciousness? No, it, it just did the thing I needed to do. And, and it did it a million times faster than the union. And that's this massive disruption I worry about. It's not the philosophical yeah. debate. It's the fact that we'll have the philosophers debating, but the thing will just be passing us. We're on the horse saying the car isn't alive, but the car doesn't care. It's running at 2000 horsepower. Uh, that's a right. very long debate. Uh, well, yeah, there are different parts of that debate. And I would just push back and say that when you have, there are a lot of questions along the way. Like, how did we get a system that was built without um, the compensation of the people whose words went into it? How yes. did we get, how do we get artwork that, ha or text that has really intensely built in biases that aren't visible because we can't see the, we can't see inside the, I know it's abused this term, but see inside the black box. These are really big questions in terms of deployment of a technology. I don't, let's put aside the question of intelligence. Does it do what we want it to do? Does it do it ethically? Does it do it in a way that actually means after yesterday's big, or was it yesterday or two days ago, the big sort of uh, open AI blorp where GPT just started generating nonsense. You're uh, talking about Google shutting down Gemini. Oh, no, I'm not talking about that. Another That's one. Different. That's a separate yeah, We question. didn't cover that in our news segment, but for, <laughs> for our listeners, Gemini started doing really weird things when prompted to draw humans, including confusing people racially, confusing people's gender, and just generally breaking. So they apparently they had done an up, upgrade that, that apparently had a paradoxical result, and they had to shut it down while they fixed it. They, they also it's had... called HAL. You're not fixing it. It's <laughs> unknowable, right? Well, Katie, you just hinted at it. It's a black box. Yeah. And you're also, there were, there were definitely constraints and system prompts that were being, that just weren't very well considered, but we couldn't see them. We just saw the outputs. Well, and that's, that's part of the we're, problem. We're in that position with all algorithms. We don't know when yeah. we're scrolling on Reels or tri TikTok why we're seeing uh, consecutive images next to each other. Although, obviously... I know it knows I like sailing and golf, so right. it shows me a lot of those. But then exactly. it shows me other stuff that isn't related, and I always wonder, why did it stick that in there? I think partly because it, it wants to know if it can entice me into other topics. And so there's an opaque algorithm at work there. Yeah, I, and I a lot of this there. is data, right? Like I know is... it's there, but I'm not quite sure what, what it's taking from me or doing for me uh, or doing to me. So... Uh, I, yeah, AI is similar, but we live in a world where we're used to that. Yeah, we're used to it. And I think AI is a really great moment. And this is going back to teaching, too. It's a really great moment to draw people's attention back to some of the things we've because it's so fast, right? So we're seeing the hype cycle a lot faster than we did over the many years of the Internet's growth, right? We're seeing lots of things that we maybe should have noticed a long time ago with social media, for instance. I hopped on that bandwagon. Now I look back and say, oh, guess what kind of data I've had students, I taught a course in the rise of generative AI last fall, and it was mostly computer science students, actually. But you know what? They got really interested when we started to look at terms of service and the kinds of data that we're giving away for free or the ways in which companies can play those games with our data. And education's a big data market. We can't. So I think that's when I say critical AI literacy, the importance of building that is like looking at those questions. And it's not just a question of whether or not this is really intelligence in the way that human, that's an interesting question. But I think there are all sorts of other questions that students who are entering a workforce eventually, not to mention their lives, right? Here's, they here's, need to know where the failure modes are. They need to know what the ethical questions are. They need to know whether it works for, and the affordances it have work for their what they're doing. It's a very different thing to see writing than it is to see computer code. And the problems in both cases are very different or advanced math, which it does very poorly now. But like, why is it doing what it's doing? And I think it's important to I keep, this is a predictive, it gives you plausible responses for a prompt, right? It, and it does that based on a very large data set. And so thinking about why it does what it does and how it does what it does and whether or not we can work with it 
or whether or not there are places where it doesn't make sense. Those are all questions I think our students, if we have those conversations with our students that are not abstract, but very practical, that helps them go to their employer and say, you know what, maybe you shouldn't send that. Maybe you shouldn't be sending a message to people that is an emotional message. This would invite Chad GBT when they actually think a real person wrote it. Or maybe we should really have somebody who's an expert check these outputs before we put them in a textbook, which has already happened. They're so, already go ahead, Charlie, ask your question, then I'll follow up on that. As an adjunct who teaches almost full time mm -hmm. and has been doing so for five years, I have a perspective on the current state of education mm. and the current state of our college students and the world in which they are uh, launching into their lives. So this is a very broken system that is almost impossible to reform from the inside. So we just keep on doing what we've done for 400 years. And I don't think we serve our students very well. Now, the system is flexible enough so the students who really want to get career-oriented education can, uh, but the vast majority major in, don't major in computer science and engineering. They go into uh, areas of education that give them softer skills. Some of them can make something out of that. Some of them can't. But the cost of it is out of line with the benefit of it today. Sec second of all, uh, so my orientation is, and what I tell my students is, skills over degrees. Once you, your degree helps you get your first job. But once you've gotten your first job, it's really about your last job, and it is no longer about your degree. And the fastest way for young people to rise in a company and to become indispensable is to have skills, to have hard skills, not soft skills. I would disagree with that. I, I don't get into it because it's my other perspective is out of a class of, I guess I've got about 40 students this semester, I would say like less than 10 have a good idea of why they're there. The rest of them are there because they're supposed to be there. Their peers yes. are there. This is the way it's done. They're just following the track that was laid out for them. But it is a complete waste of time and money for them to be there. Now, I, again, the I do teach at a public university, ASU, but they're graduate students. So it's not apples to apples. The graduate students are a very different group of people than the undergraduates. But among the undergraduates, I think they are vastly underserved by this system. It is a system that needs deeply needs disruption. And I also think, and here's the final one, you can take any piece of this that you want, you know, <laughs> less than 10 minutes left, but most of the money that goes into universities does not reach the faculty, right? Very little of the $250,000 that a student spends on education is actually spent on the product. The, the final thing is that something is going on in secondary education, which makes the college education so problematic. And I come, students come to me, they don't know what parts, what, how a computer is made. They don't know, it used to be that you'd have to know how to change a tire. But today you need to know how, what's inside of a computer. So you spend all your life with a machine and you don't know how it's made. <laughs> So yeah, there's a really good South Park episode about that for uh, anybody that wants to watch it. My college students come in and I'm like, okay, first I'm going to give you everything they skipped in high school <laughs> because I can't explain how emerging media works if you don't know what's inside of a computer, right? If you don't know what's inside of a computer, half of the things I say to you in the next 16 weeks are not going to make any sense. This That's is an overall yeah. sort of critique of education and in particular, sure. it's cost. And yeah. I really think the approach has to change. And by the way, the I did not think teaching during the pandemic was bad. And of course, the thing is, of course, the excellent students made the most of it. And the other students muddled through it the best way that they could, which always happens, right? That happens in the physical world. The best students get the most out of it. And they're, of course, the most satisfying students to teach because you get instant gratification. With other students, maybe the gratification comes a decade later where you see this is a person who has great critical thinking skills and doesn't take facts for their face value. And, and I know those are the skills that you're talking about that are so valuable, right? Those, it, it's a education spent on reading and discussion develops maturity and is never wasted, right? It goes into your head and it can never be taken away from you.
So those are the great things about education. But I also delivered those remotely where the economy of the education and its outcome would be improved over today, right? Today, they're paying for Fraternity Row and the massive dining hall and the exercise center. The, so the athletic center, that's what they're paying for. So it seems to me that the incentives are off, the way that we deliver the content of our courses is off, the skills that we want to develop, I'm not sure we're developing. And that's a big leap. There isn't that much proof. The people that we educated that way are highly dissatisfied 10 years later. Uh, and again, partly not the fault of the university, but partly it is. So, so that's a lot to unpack. Yeah, it's right? a lot yeah. to unpack. But as <laughs> I have a lot to, to, to say that. about this, I have a lot to say about this topic. Clearly, Clearly you don't have anybody else to say it to. That's true. why you're here. But Katie, if you do a little boil down of all that, yeah, yeah. Basically, it's the debate between trade school versus matriculation, right? It's the debate between skill-based school versus liberal arts university-based education. So that's probably where you want to start with, uh, with your- Yeah, comment. I think, I, I personally think, and this is what I was saying about AI's drawing, AI, if we go back to that initial topic, that like bringing into focus some things that we, and making us, I hope, pay attention to some of those things you're talking about. I would disagree that I think the hard skills, soft skills things, it isn't actually, there are lots of competencies. And one of the things that changes if you're a petroleum engineer, that's great. But if you don't need petroleum engineers, you need to be able to pivot. And that's one of the things that sort of being able to let me just give you a skill that would be considered a soft skill, the ability to read strategically and critically, mm -hmm. be able to pick out what's important, synthesize that and see the forest and the trees at the but same you time. Have to, you have to learn how to learn. Yeah. And, you ha and those are things that will help you be an excellent diagnostician as a doctor as well as English professor or teacher. But I do think, personally, I think it would be great if we didn't have the sort of pipeline directly into, for all 18-year-olds to say they have to go to college immediately. Or, or I do think they're, some of the best students I have are returning students. And those returning students Precisely. are the ones that ask those questions. Like, why are we doing this? And then you can answer it. And I love to answer those questions now as a seasoned teacher was terrifying if I got asked those questions when I was a new teacher, but because I had done what was done before. But I think we're well past the stage, at least in my field. Maybe it's different in other fields. We're well past the stage of just doing what we've done before. We're trying to be responsive to the current moment. But at the same time, we have pressures like AI being a really interesting example of something that is a sort of general, it's a, to quote Jane Rosenzweig, it's to what problem is chat GPT the solution? That is a question for educators. Like, it's not a problem that I needed solving. It's not solving mm. a problem for me. And to just say, oh, I guess I have to use it now. I want to teach about it. I want people to be prepared to use it. But I want to use the skills in my domain where I have domain expertise to help students probe it so that they, if they do use it, and they probably will, that they do it in a way that makes sense, right? That's what and you Katie, can't can I, necessarily do that in it. You may not have space to do that in a trade school. I'm going to throw something out there, which we don't have enough time to solve. But um, that's not fair. I, I'm working deeply in AI. Um, yeah. And I'm working to build AI that does not do this. So I'm not an advocate of what open AI and I think others are doing. But the problem they are solving is us. That's why people are having a hard time. It's replacing us. They're just not saying it fully out loud. I've been in too many meetings with a lot of the high-end people. At, yeah. Tech for the last decade. That's why we are struggling to understand how we work with those things. They're not meant to work with us, really. They're meant to replace us because why are we problems? We don't always show up to work. We work slow. We don't know. We quit. We do all these things. The problem is us. This is what the big HAL, like HAL 2001 companies are solving is that. And I think that's the cognitive dissonance that we're not quite seeing. But is now, that the new, Brony, is that a new problem? Because you could go back to Monsanto and DuPont trying to solve the, uh, the farming equation of the manual labor and effort that went into farming and how to feed the world. And we can debate on both sides of the equation, both good and bad there, right? The question, is this fundamentally different than anything else on the pathway of humanity yes. that has moved us into and the for, age where we sit today? And for no, no, whom yes. is it solving it? It is not solving that problem for the people who... 
do that a work. Tiny group. And, uh, it's solving yeah, it for right. a tiny group. What what it's Absolutely. really doing, we can go on a very long tyrant about this, but it is, I call it centralized computing autocracy. Yeah. It is moving the resource of the world into the hands of a very small group yeah. who will have a central autocratic control of the world. And people are willingly doing that. God, the, I hope I'm opposite, part of that group. The opposite is. Uh, I feel like sorry, sorry for the people who aren't in that group. I hope and, it includes me. And Katie, I think you're part of what I would call like decentralized democratic computing, right? <laughs> Which is computing to benefit 99.99% of the world. But I think what we're seeing is a shift of power yeah. in the most extreme way from almost everyone to a few. Yeah. And that centralized autocracy is really scary because it's embedding into computing, which affects everything. Or there's an alternate path, which is like a decentralized, more democratic computing structure. By the way, none of the companies receiving big funding right now are on the path of decentralized democratic computing. They yeah. are all forms of centralized autocracy, which is yeah. terrifying. And, and I there's think there's regulatory capture here. That's that again, when I say critical AI literacy, that's what I'm talking about too. It's part of these larger conversations about how we create the world we want. And that's what I said to my students, right? This is your world. I'm getting old. Yeah, I'm exactly. not that old, but I'm getting old. Like, this is the world you inherit. You need to have a Good place God, in. I hope they replace our, the, us boomers soon enough. We're not <laughs> retiring. I'm not a boomer. I, we're I'm not retiring. Ask. It makes the generation behind <laughs> us very impatient. Uh, so, listen, that's all the time X we baby, have. X baby, X baby, Jenna, anyway. We, uh, this is all the time we have, which is sucky, because once we're really getting going with our guests, exactly. we have to stop. Uh, but it was a pleasure having you here. I'm sorry, we really didn't get topic of how can AI solve these problems in both <laughs> higher education and solve the problems, not just for higher education, but for our students and make sure that we're, we're graduating AI literate people who are going to be in that first group. That's what we owe them. How, how do you get in the group that determines what AI does and are not the recipient uh, of what it does? Brony's shaking his head. We're going to go. Like like what he's going to say. To be answer, cat literate. I answer. think. I know what Rhodey's going to say. It's not going to be so easy to get into that group. It's not going to be that oh. one. Uh, so anyway, thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll be back next Friday. Catherine, I hope we see you again. And uh, I would love to be back. Good good luck with the third act of your career at UK. I love my colleagues at uh, Chapman and ASU. We are all in the same boat trying to do the same thing, which is to give our students the skills they need to survive in this crazy, disrupted world. And give teachers the space to do that work, too. So yes. the more we can develop that literacy amongst yes. our colleagues, the better. 100%. Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye -bye.